Hello, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, first, I must confess uh, how hard it was for me to come up here without genuflecting. I felt that I was being impious in some way. I don't know anything about the beliefs of Christian scientists. I don't see a tabernacle, but still every part of my Catholic formation said I should kneel down somewhere over there, or at least make a little lazy half bow. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't do either. So if you too feel the need to genuflect when you're going in and out of the pew, uh, if you uh, find that you're done listening to me speak after a couple of minutes, I won't judge you uh, if you make a small genuflection on your way out. And I won't think that it's directed towards me, but towards the vague sense of being, uh, being, of being pious. Um, <laughs> but really, thank you again, all of you, for, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you for, for, for coming to uh, share in the work of the College of Fellows at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. I, I'm very grateful to be invited to speak with you uh, this morning. I'm very grateful to Dr. Hittinger and Father Sweeney and Sister Marianne for inviting me to come and speak with you uh, this morning. I'm very grateful that uh, somebody came. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm most especially excited to talk because I think that um, Gaudium et Spes is something worth discussing and I hope that the few remarks that I offer will be the, the genesis of some discussion both with my respondents and then hopefully with all of, with all of you. Um, and, uh, and especially because if you know very much about the sort of history of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology and the history of the College of Fellows in its recent years, you, uh, you know that uh, f this um, conversation which we will have this morning is a conversation uh, long delayed. I'm glad that we're finally having it because um, as some of you know, this particular convocation of the College of Fellows was delayed first by COVID and then by the sort of great diluvian waters which cascaded down the hill at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology and have been such a challenge um, in recent years. So it is really good, I think, to be together now among friends and I'm very grateful to be uh, with you. Before I start sort of formally offering my reflections on Gaudium et Spes, I do want to offer two um, important caveats. First, um, although I have been asked to speak about a pastoral council, a pastoral constitution of an ecumenical council, and about its reception in the life of the church, um, I am uh, not a theologian. Uh, I uh, am not an academic. I'm a canonist by training. And um, when canonists dip their toes into theological waters, you should know that um, we're beginning to swim in a pond which is not properly ours to begin with and upon whose surface we usually try to skate without making any errors or committing any grave heresies. And if I can get away with not doing either of those two things this morning, I think that will be sufficient. Um, I'll be proud of myself if I find that I've spoken for 30 or 35 minutes and not have professed a heresy. So um, li limit your expectations to the hope that I won't profess one either. Um, by training I'm a canonist, but to make matters worse I am by occupation a journalist. And when journalists talk about the high-minded and celestial visions of theology, you should hang on to your wallet. Um, because we're usually running some sort of a game, uh, it is much more appropriate for us to be mired in the muck and mud of human sinfulness and depravity than in the celestial truths and visions of divine revelation um, under the basic premise that water seeks its own level. So again, <laughs> please take what I have to say with that appropriate grain of salt. Um, the, uh, the second caveat that I have to give is a little bit more specific to this talk, and it's this. Uh, I was first asked to give a talk on this subject uh, at DSPP in 2021 for a convocation that we were to have at the beginning of 2022. And, uh, you know, given my own personal limitations, the limitations I just mentioned, uh, I wrote what I think was a pretty uh, good talk. It had uh, footnotes and citations, and to borrow from Arlo, Gu Arlo Guthrie, it had, you know, 27 8 by 10 colored gloss so photographs with circles. It was, it was the real deal, and I was ready. Um, so when plans for this convocation were revived a few months ago, I filed it in my mind and I thought that what I would do is a few days before I take that talk and dust it off and give it some updating in light of the past few years and be well on my way. Um, but earlier this week that plan hit a snag because try as I might, I just can't find the really good talk that I wrote two years ago. It, you guys would have loved it. I mean, I just want to say you guys would have loved it. I want to sort of pay homage to that great talk that's lost somewhere in the recesses of, of a server. I, I don't even know what a server is, uh, far be, let alone know how to find the thing in the thing. So what will probably happen is I'll give this talk, which is a sort of uh, secondary iteration of something that was once great, and then we'll go over and have some wine and cheese, and I'll immediately remember what I named the file and sort of run off and, 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 and get the thing and, and print it out just to prove to you that once there was a time when I had something really inside to say about Gaudium and Spes, and that time was three years ago. Um, but with all of that said, I am uh, very glad to talk about Gaudium et Spes, the Council's pastoral constitution, because I do think it has something important to say and something well worth considering for all of us. I think, honestly, it gives us a mandate for further conversation in the church and for reflection about our own participation in the church's most essential mission. 
I've said now a few times that the text is a pastoral, council, a pastoral constitution, which is a unique term among the documents of the Second Vatican Council. The council, as I think most of you know, produced four sort of tentpole documents around which everything else of the Second Vatican Council is organized. Sacrosanctum Concilium on the liturgy, Dei Verbum, a dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Lumen Gentium, a dogmatic constitution on the church, and then Gaudium et Spes. Um, and those documents are the documents around which uh, everything else uh, of the Second Vatican Council is organized. The principles uh, of those documents are the principles into which all the other documents sort of can, can fit and, and, and become applications. Um, but Gaudium et Spes is unique even among those. When Pope St. John XXIII opened the Second Vatican Council, he said that its aim was to see the church become greater in spiritual riches and then gaining the strength of new energies to look to the future without fear. The Pope added that by bringing herself up to date where required, the church will make men, families, and peoples really turn their minds to heavenly things. He had the anticipation that the work of the Second Vatican Council would be a dramatic conversion or reconversion, a deepening of faith for Catholics and for people of goodwill, for people who would hear the gospel around the world. <clears throat> the aim of the council, he said, was to see the church's doctrine influence the numerous fields of human activity by bringing together the church's best energies and striving to have men welcome more favorably the good tidings of salvation. John XXIII said that the council had a kind of unifying and universal aim to consolidate the path toward the unity of mankind which is required as a necessary foundation to bring people together but for a purpose in order that the earthly city, our home here on earth, may be brought to the resemblance of the heavenly city where truth reigns, charity is the law, and whose extent is eternity. The Second Vatican Council is unique in its, ambitious, in its really ambitious aims, and unique, or I think mostly unique, among the ecumenical councils of the church, in that it wasn't convened to formally address some precise theological controversy or to correct some error. Rather, Pope St. John XXIII wanted to rearticulate the nature and mission of the church by drawing from her own perennial tradition and expressing that tradition in a way which might better resonate with Catholics living in his time. He wanted also to update the church's juridic structures in order to reflect the situation of his church in his time, which is why John XXIII also called for the promulgation of a new code of canon law to be developed after the conclusion of the council and in light of the considerations of the council. In light of its mission, in light of that broad and ambitious aim, the council took up a different form than had many of its predecessors. It didn't promulgate creedal formulas as, as had many of the earliest ecumenical councils or a list of anathemas and canons, condemned propositions, um, as was the, most often the case in prior ecumenical councils. Um, instead, it sort of borrowed from and fleshed out and expanded upon an element of its immediate predecessor, Vatican Council I, to promulgate teaching documents which contain elements of Catholic doctrine to be affirmed, situations in, situated in broad contexts of, of catechesis. Vatican II promulgated 16 documents addressing various elements of the Church's ministry, most of which can be seen to flow directly from the dogmatic constitutions at its center, Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum. But Gaudium et Spes is unique even among those 16 documents because it's meant to be an expression not of what the council has to say about the church, but of how the, the council might be applied, implemented, or lived in the life of the church. But that means that the hermeneutic key of Gaudium et Spes is Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum. It should be interpreted in light of them and can't be understood except, a, except as a mandate to implement their principles in the life of the world and the practice of the church. Now Gaudium et Spes is also unique because it is a pastoral constitution. Because it is a pastoral constitution and not a dogmatic constitution, there's, even mo there, there's a great deal of flexibility to debate um, the prudence of its articulation of Catholic doctrine and the Catholic, and the Catholic mission as Gaudium et Spes itself outlines it. And while the text articulates, articulates a beautiful vision of the human person, of the power of the incarnation to, transfer individuals, to transform individuals and communities, and the importance of a charismatic proclamation of the gospel, it also suffers, I think, in some ways that we can see quite clearly after reflection of 60 years of, of Gaudium et Spes. Um, uh, in, it suffers in ways which limit its intended effect. The text is frequently inconsistent. In places, it's unreasonably optimistic, and at times, it, it seems to me naive about the relationship of the church to contemporary culture. Those problems don't mean that Gaudium et Spes is not relevant or useful for Christians, but the problems have contributed to frequent misinterpretations of the document and to the controversial reputation it has gained among Catholics in the 60 years since its promulgation. But properly um, interpreted, I would like to argue that the document is still relevant for the life of the church today and is still waiting and wanting to be taken up by Catholics who are keen to live the extraordinary calling of their baptism. What's first unique about Gaudium et Spes is that it's not addressed merely to bishops or even to Catholics. It is addressed to the entirety of the world. 
And it begins with a beautiful expression of human solidarity on the part of the church, which I'd like to read to you. Listen to this beautiful meditation, which is probably familiar to many of you. The joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts, for theirs is a community composed of men, united in Christ they are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom, and they have welcomed the news of salvation which is meant for every man. That is why this Christian community realizes that it is truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. From there, from that vision of solidarity of Christians with the, with the entirety of the world, the document aims to develop a deeply Christocentric humanism, a reflection on the goodness of being a person, the goodness of the human community, and an affirmation that man finds his identity, the meaning of his life, his place in the universe, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Consider Gaudium et Spes 22. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, namely Christ, the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of this mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. It is not surprising then that in him all the aforementioned truths of the council find their root and attain their crown. Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, is himself the perfect man. To the sons of Adam, he restores the divine likeness which has been disfigured from their first sin onward. Since human nature, as he assumed it, was not annulled by, the very fact, by that very fact, it has been raised up to a divine dignity in our respect too. By his incarnation, the Son of God has united himself in some fashion with every man. He worked with human hands, he thought with the human mind, acted by human choice, and loved with the human heart. Born of the Virgin Mary, he has truly been one of us, like us in all things but sin. The document articulates powerfully, beautifully, I think, that absent the transforming incarnation of Christ, no human community, no human family, no human life will find its final fulfillment. That however much God speaks in and through the natural law, quote, God alone can satisfy the deepest cravings of the human heart, for the world and what it has to offer can never fully content it. In short, the document proposes a vision of human flourishing, both for individuals and for communities, that is found in divine intimacy. That articulation isn't novel. It's, it's embedded in, I think, the theological tradition of the church and the spiritual tradition of the church since the time of the fathers. Um, but it does kind of fly in the face or serve as a correction to a rigoristic or legalistic approach to the Christian faith. Or, I think, all the more to an anemic vision of the human life, a kind of empty moralism which might see the avoidance of sin as a good but fail to appreciate the richness of life in this world in Jesus Christ. Let, let me give you an example, if I can, from my discipline, um, uh, canon law, of how the Christological anthropology of Gaudium et Spes has had practical effect in the life of the church. Um, are there any canonists here? Oh, that's too bad. Um, but it might also be good for me, because if what I say isn't true, there will be no one who knows that. <laughs> Unless there's a secret canonist. Uh, every canonist worth his salt should be able to rattle off to you reflexively, uh, without thinking and from memory, Canon 1055 of the 1983, the 1983 Code of Canon Law's definition, uh, definitional canon of marriage. The matrimonial covenant by which a man and woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life, and which is ordered by its nature to the good of spouses and the procreation and education of children, has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament between the baptized. That definition, you've probably heard, expresses two ends of marriage. Let me tell you again. The matrimonial covenant is a partnership of the whole of life ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of children. It expresses two ends of marriage, the bonum prolis, the procreation and education of children, and the bonum conjugum, the good of the spouses. And remarkably, it articulates those ends of marriage as co-equal in dignity. This is a radical shift in the church's articulation of marriage and its ends from Canon 1013 of the 1917 Code, the, the code which preceded the Second Vatican Council, which said that the primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children, and the secondary end is mutual assistance and the remedy of concupiscence. This, of course, is drawn from Casta Canubia, as probably most of you know. Um, but the shift from talking about marriage as a remedy of concupiscence to talking about marriage as the locus of a spouse's ultimate good um, means that the church has taken up, I think, a refreshingly robust vision of marriage which sees the human flourishing of the spouses as an essentially good thing in itself. It's reflective, I think, of that Christological anthropology embedded in Gaudium et Spes, namely that human flourishing is accomplished through conformity to, to the dictates of divine revelation. Without negating the more classic formulation, the notion of the 
of, of the mutual assistance and the remedy of concupiscence. concupiscence. The Gaudium et Spes formulation emphasizes that the bonum conjugum is, 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 uh, is, 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 ought to be substantially taken up at the same time as the bonum prolis and seen as a good in itself. And that living in accord with God's plan, with God's plan the interpersonal dimension of marriage is affirmed, therefore, as a good articulated in a positive expression. Um, which emphasizes that marriage is a species of human friendship, that one can find their deepest sort of subjective and effective ends in marriage, um, and because of that, the locus of divine friendship. In several, and not, by the way, just sacramental marriage. This is an affirmation of marriage in its natural expression as a profound human good which might draw us more deeply uh, into intimacy with God. In several places, on the family, on culture, on the political community, Gaudium et Spes does the same thing, reminding the world that the fullness of human happiness is found only in the intimacy with God, which comes through the reception and obedience to divine revelation. In fact, Gaudium et Spes is, in my mind, at its best when it's doing precisely that, expressing that all aspects of the human experience find their fullness in Jesus Christ. But that's not everything the text does, and therein come the criticisms. At the same time that Gaudium et Spes develops a fundamentally Christological anthropology, it also seems to posit what Ratzinger referred to as a Tehardian notion of human moral progress, human consciousness, and human community, with the notion that they are ever evolving towards perfection on their own, and which can be probably correlated with the Enlightenment idea that man can conquer nature itself, including human nature, to become the master of his own destiny. Passages of the text, which remain sensible when read in light of the universal vocation to holiness, are often so understated, so subtle, on that point as to seem to point to a kind of human fulfillment for man limited to the temporal and devoid of the transcendent and transformative relationship with God. Consider this excerpt from paragraph 26. Every day, human interdependence grows more tightly drawn and spread by degrees over the world. As a result, the common good, the sum of, the, of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively through and ready access to their own fulfillment, readily thorough, relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment, today takes on an increasingly universal complexion and consequently invokes rights and duties with respect to the whole human race. The eternal destiny of man, I think, is implied in the notion of fulfillment uh, in paragraph 26, but it's not stated, leaving that passage, like many others, seemingly ambiguous about the vision the church actually has for the human person. Or consider paragraph 3. This paragraph, proclaiming the noble destiny of man and championing the godlike seed which has been sown in him, in the natural law, offers to mankind the human assistance of the church in fostering that brotherhood of all men which corresponds to his destiny. The council fathers have in mind, even in the text of Lumen Gentium, that the assistance that they're talking about, the assistance which the church offers to man, uh, is assistance in finding and befriending the Lord Jesus Christ in a sacramental relation, a redemptive sacramental relationship. But the ambiguity of the specific text on that point, and at various other points in the document, can lead to a reading of Gaudium et Spes which leaves the church reduced to an NGO or a friendly association of good neighbors. What a terrific waste of time it would be to live in a Christianity without Jesus Christ. What a terribly sad thing that would be. Further, the text is often indeed uh, unreason excuse me, the text is indeed often unreasonably internally inconsistent on its discussion of human progress and especially its relationship to technology. On the one hand, Gaudium et Spes warns that technological developments have terrifically harmful potential for the human community, warning, warning for example, about the prospect of atomic annihilation, which was on the mind of a lot of people in the 1960s. But on the other hand, Gaudium et Spes offers the idea that technological progress will inevitably serve the human community for the good, that technology will, for some inevitable and innate reason, which is unstated, unite people, reduce poverty, and confer peace upon the world. Uh, in a certain sense, I think the historical context for the document explains why Gaudium et Spes, even as the Council Fathers see the harmful tech potential for technology, keep coming back to this relentless and unexplained optimism. The theologian Tracy Rowland says, she wrote a few years ago, that if you want to try to understand Gaudium et Spes, you have to remember that it was written just a few years after we put a dog in space. I think that's probably true. The dog in space stuff was pretty cool and uh, probably did feed a kind of universal optimism about the potential for human technology. And, and not only that, it's not just like a, who's the dog? Um, at the same time that Gaudium et Spes was being written, scientists were accomplishing extraordinary uh, boosts in wheat yields in Mexico and on, were on the verge of doing the same thing in India and Pakistan, ushering in a global agricultural revolution. At the same time, uh, just really uh, months before the Council Fathers began assembling, colored television sets had finally gained market saturation and integrated circuits were becoming more widely available, setting seminally in motion the digital revolution which has transformed this area of, of, of the country, but also the world. Sure, it's the 1960s. Communism divided the world. And the Council Fathers had issued strident condemnations of systematic socialized atheism. 
But there was a sense, a broad cultural sense, that, overwhelming technological, that the overwhelming technological revolution of the time would eventually bring down even the wall to the Iron Curtain. Plus, the Council Fathers had experienced in the decade prior to Vatican II one of the most extraordinary revolutions and underappreciated revolutions of the modern economy, namely containerization. Frame the conciliar bullishness around technology in all of that. And consider that the Council Fathers were also optimistic about technology because they wanted to emphasize, they thought it was important to emphasize the intelligibility of the universe and even affirm the positive relationship between faith and reason between God and science. It just seems that in their eagerness to confirm the relationship, the positive relationship between faith and reason, they often went far too far. Because of course now, here's what we know. Containerization would do an unbelievable amount of good, but it would have unprecedented, unprecedented negative effects, destructive environmental effects, um, and a globalized economy would accelerate the era of libertarian, extractive capitalism and ideological colonization warned about by Pope Francis. The technological and silicon revolution would make pornography ubiquitous, facilitate human trafficking, flatten souls and fragment human cultures into millions of performative microcultures which have ushered in unprecedented mental health crises among young people. And the sexual revolution, which is also a technological revolution, would shatter the family, would make abortion widespread and ultimately render plastic even the most basic questions about human identity. In light of those things, it's probably no wonder that Ratzinger and Karl Rahner were both critical of the sunny technocratic optimism of Gaudium et Spes, with Ratzinger accusing the text of Pelagianism, Pelagianism and saying at one point that its sections on human progress could benefit from a healthy dose of Martin Luther's sense of human depravity. <laughs> you gotta hand it for Ratzinger. I mean, the guy always had the right quip at the right time. <laughs> But if you ask me, the misplaced optimism about technology is not the most misplaced optimism of the text. The most misplaced optimism of the text is the church's sense, uh, in the, in the, count, the Council Father's sense of the church's own importance in, in human engagement in the decades to come. If there's a kind of tragically fatal optimism of Gaudium and Spes, of Gaudium and Spes it's the notion that the church's doctrinal, moral, and anthropological contributions to cultural, social, and political discourse would be readily accepted in the spheres of civil society. That the church would be accepted in the decades after Gaudium and Spes as a partner in dialogue just because she wished it to be. I think the Council Fathers failed to understand that it would become a nearly universally accepted tenant of most spheres of civil society that the church has nothing worth hearing because religion is harmful, unduly restrictive of the, ten, the trend towards self-definition, and useful only insofar as religion can be instrumentalized to partisan purposes. On its own terms, the kind of a priori assumption that the church would be able to show up and say, with something to say about civil affairs seems increasingly unten untenable to us in an era in the West of wholesale institutional disaffiliation. To some extent, I think that wound is self-inflicted. Now we can see that few can take seriously a kind of self-asserted moral authority from the church of Theodore McCarrick or Marco Rupnik. To the extent that the church can be a credible contributor to civil dialogue, I think we can now see that it will be because she earns moral credibility through transparent reform and sincere penance, and neither of those things have yet happened. Finally, Gaudium et Spes suffers from something which I think is not its fault, entirely its fault. It suffers from a kind of reduction to a totem, a shibboleth, in the ecclesiastical culture wars of the past few decades. Because Gaudium et Spes was in the period after the Council almost immediately taken up by the school of thought which regarded the Second Vatican Council principally as an event as the initiation of a process, a new way of being church, of singing a new church into being, if you will, rather than as the promulgation of some authoritative texts whose meaning could be understood by perhaps reading them. Under the guise of that context, the framing of Vatican II as an unfolding event, the call in Gaudium et Spes to dialogue and the endorsement of the legitimate autonomy of the secular sphere are both good things on their own, but they've been too often taken up to as a kind of call to cloying, prattling, relentlessly non-judgmental dialogue about nothing, a kind of empty-headed baptism of the secular in an effort to accommodate or welcome those who have not yet been converted. Whatever its flaws, that approach to Gaudium et Spes is an abuse but one which has not been entirely eradicated from the church's culture and one which in some circles is now enjoying even a kind of resurgence. It will be a while, I think, before we're able to read Vatican, the texts of Vatican II as texts, before our instruction of them is completely sort of devoid from the sort of partisan and political interpretations which have shaped it, the debate about the council over the past several decades. O tempora, o mores. So with legitimate, those legitimate criticisms outlaid, why do I say that Gaudium et Spes has something to offer the church right now? The reason is because read properly in the context of Lumen Gentium Dei Verbum, 
it becomes clear that Gaudium et Spes' call to dialogue is contextualized, is understood, can only be meaningful within the prophetic and sacramental identity of the church in which the mystery of the cross sanctifies the world. Read that way, the call of Lumen Gentium to dialogue is a call to a kind of charismatic dialogue, to a transformative proclamation of the kingdom of God, the forgiveness of sins, and the profound and confounding mystery of our own call to divinization. In many ways, I think that, as members of the College of Fellows pointed out in our discussion yesterday, the mandate of that charismatic dialogue, which has as its deepest proclamation and con uh, which has its deepest end proclamation of conversion, can be seen as the outline for much of the pastoral work of the John Paul II papacy, which aimed in the catechetical teachings and pastoral initiatives at the evangelization of the family, of culture, of young people, and of civil societies, all of which emphasize the elevating and transcendent vision of Christological humanism, which is expressed in Gaudium et Spes. <clears throat> But, and this is going to make some of you, like me, feel old, the John Paul II papacy is now nearly two decades in the rearview mirror. It doesn't seem like that. And the world has dramatically changed since that time. Indeed, one of the most profound ways, the most profound changes is the way in which technology has fra fractured and splintered once ordinary experiences of human culture, with the resultant effect of far more individualized and atomized human community of loneliness or despair than Pope John Paul II could have ever imagined. We're more connected and yet more isolated. And we experience, because of that, a kind of crushing ex existential despair, not only about the meaning or purpose of life, but even about the forms of life, even about the patterns and practices of our fathers and mothers, which, in which we might find some vestigial clues to the fullness of a life well lived. Matthew Crawford, I think, correctly diagnoses the despair of living without what he calls cultural jigs, patterns in which to, conform our, to which to conform ourselves. To be sure, the technological progress championed by Gaudium et Spes has continued unabated. But we now realize, most of us, how enslaved we have become to all its empty works and promises. Set against that backdrop, the impetus to dialogue in the key of kerygma is all the more acute. The world is sorely in need of the evangelization Gaudium et Spes calls us to offer. Have we offered it or found a path to offering it? Not for the world of John Paul II or the halcyon days of Gaudium et Spes, but for our own time. In small ways, in limited expressions, in small pockets, I think the answer is yes. But I think if we survey the ecclesiastical landscape, it's clear to most of us that the church is still often engaged in the battles and methodologies of yesteryear. The culture war and virtue signaling and partisan, sni and partisan sniping about Vatican II itself that I mentioned above. A misguided effort to retain moral credibility through accommodation or dilution of Christian doctrine. And often, Foolish effort on the part of ecclesiastical officials to align themselves or the, Catholic they, the Catholics they lead with one or the other of America's morally bankrupt political parties. A sentimental attachment to institutions of earlier generations, to Catholic colleges and schools which once transmitted the living faith and now have become too often albatrosses around the neck of the church's limited resources. And today, a focus of the church's energy and efforts on the internal conversation of the past few years which we have called the Synod on Synodality, which, if the International Theological Commission is to, believe, to be believed, and I think we should believe them, um, a, is a common Christian discernment among the baptism, uh, excuse me, among the baptized, and is not the same thing as the charismatic dialogue envisioned by the Council Fathers in Gaudium et Spes. This is, this is an aside, but I, I actually think in some ways that the Synod on Synodality project is much more closely connected in principle to John Paul II's vision of the new evangelization, the evangelization of those who are sacramentally Catholic but devoid of effective faith, than it is connected to the vision of Gaudium et Spes for dialogue out extra with the world. But whatever you think of the Synod on Synodality, and I could be wrong about that, for good or for ill, its end is not proclaiming or revealing Christ to the world for the elevation and transformation of the human experience. Its end lies within the experience of the co communion of the baptized and a common discernment about how we can live our life together and not beyond that. So where do we see a kind of commitment to charismatic dialogue? In the United States, as I sort of survey the contemporary American ecclesiastical landscape, I would say that I, I at least see it most especially in the ecclesial movements which have arisen in the past several decades, in communion and liberation, the neocatechumenal way, and others like them, which have as their end in different ways the proclamation of the central theme of Gaudium et Spes. You, you were made for more. Your life is made to be, more, to, to be lived more richly. But what's clear is that leaving aside the text problems and its own limited temporal view, to become a kind of church of Gaudium et Spes is to reflect on how parishes, religious institutes, families, and lay people are formed to understand their own apostolic identity and mission, 
formed to understand that they were made for mission, and their mission has a concrete and a specific mandate, not the sort of nebulous notion of witnessing to the power of being a good person or, a good, co or good community members and the vague hope that someone might sort of follow us through the doors of the church because they see how happy we are. This adaptation and orientation is the kind of thing called for in Evangelii Gaudium. And in the more recent document, I think really underappreciated document, the pastoral conversion of the parish, which was promulgated by the Congregation for Clergy in 2020. If you're ordained and you haven't read the pastoral conversion of the parish, print it out, because it's really good and it outlines a mandate for parishes to better understand their identity in the contemporary milieu. It's a hugely important document. It calls for parishes to better commit to their own mission of evangelization and to adapt parish structures and, uh, and, and bureaucratic processes for the more successful initiation of Christians. What would that look like? What would a church which is more acutely aware of its missionary identity at both the institutional, individual, and family, at the institutional, individual, and family levels actually look like? That's where I think we have a lot of work to do. That's where I think in some ways we have not fully taken up the mandate of Gaudium et Spes. That's where I think in some ways, although there have been initiatives led by the Apostolic See, the central message of this text has been missed by most of us and by most of our institutions. The central question of Gaudium et Spes, properly understood, is how the church's fundamental mission of evangelization can be taken up in our modern times. It's the question the Council Fathers asked while reflecting on the particular challenges of their own time, and the question we should ask while reflecting on the particular challenges of ours. This is a question both about content and methodology, about message and structure. How do we evangelize our peers? And when we do, how do we take up the catechesis and initiation of the converted? How do we take up their integration into the Christian community? How do we express Christ in spaces which are not spaces at all? How do we make Christ present on continents which exist only digitally and among the disparate and emerging cultures of the change in epoch we are undergoing? The good news is I think that's the work of the DSPT, the College of Fellows, and all of us of goodwill to discern in prayer and conversation and experience. I think the conversation now begins for us, if charismatic proclamation to the world is our mission, in what, what is the world, what are the particular challenges, the joys and sufferings, the griefs and anxieties of our own time, and how might we be speak, speak Christ into them? In closing, I'd just like to offer a kind of mandate from the, from the Council of Fathers and Gaudium et Spes, which I think is quite beautiful and which I hope um, will be a better reflection for you than anything I've said. The Council focuses its attention on the world of men, the whole human and men being a gender-inclusive term for the Council Fathers. They were not yet aware of how... I'm just kidding. Um, the, <laughs> the Council focuses its attention on the world of men, the whole human family along with the sum of those realities in the midst of which it lives, that world which is the theater of man's history and the air of his energies, his tragedies and his triumphs, that world which the Christian sees as created and sustained by his Maker's love, fallen indeed into the bondage of sin, yet emancipated now by Christ, who was crucified and rose again to break the stranglehold of personified evil so that the world might be fashioned anew according to God's design and reach its fulfillment. May all of us work that the world might be fashioned anew according to God's design and therefore to reach its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Thank you.